Uh, my name is Augustine Konashi. I'm a software engineer with the BBC. And I'm going to be talking today about some of the work we've been doing in improving the performance and scalability of our content metadata publishing pipeline. I'll give an introduction about one of the use cases in terms of publishing content metadata and distributing it. And then I'll give an overview of our main architecture and what the issues are that we face in terms of scalability and performance. And then I'll talk about the work we've been doing in building materialized views to deal with that, those issues. And finally, a few things we have to consider, or things that we have, we have to deal with as part of this work. So the main use case is um, moving metadata about BBC content from the systems that, that create it, mainly editorial systems, to the systems that consume it, mainly audience-facing products. So from content management systems on one end to the sports website, iPlayer, blah, 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 on, on the other. And we need to get this metadata published and distributed within the BBC. So most of what I'll be talking about is internal, it's closed, a closed system, mainly within the BBC. So the team that I work with is um, involved in propagating some of this metadata across, and we've been heavily used and um, linked data solutions, triple stars for over the last five to six years to do this. And th the type of data we're particularly interested in is data relating to tagging BBC content. So in this case, you have, you have this node here which represents some BBC content, maybe an article page, maybe a story, maybe a live stream. It, you have things like the title, date it was created, locator within the BBC where you can fetch the actual content from. And you have this about properties linking it to other BBC entities, mainly people, places, organizations, uh, abstract concepts that are of interest to both us and our audiences. And then what happens is these things could also have properties on their own and be linked to other open source, um, open linked data solutions like the um, DVPDA, et cetera. So it's metadata like this created typically alongside the actual content. So when a journalist is actually creating the article, typing it up, that's when data like this is captured and needs to go through some system. So the systems that then have audience-facing products can then query, query that system and get that metadata out and say, oh, a typical, a typical example is something like this. You can say, give me all the top 10 articles about English football team or the right date published. And then that metadata can then be used in various ways to enrich um, user experience. This is just one example that I've put out here. So it's about getting the data from the source to the destination, basically. And the team that I work with, um, we maintain the central triple store where all this data lives and the APIs around it that data. So our clients typically would be editorial systems manned by journalists and distribution systems used to, used to um, basically display data to users. And we have these central clusters, triple stock clusters at the middle that has all this data. We have APIs on both ends. So to write data, we have a write API that handles things like access control and validation. So before data gets into the system, we check that it meets certain business rules, it's of the right format, et cetera, and then we, we ingest that data. And on the read side, most of our clients, we have a fairly rich, flexible read API that would expose this data to our internal clients. So they will query us using normal HTTP with query parameters behind the scenes. We then generate Sparkle and send that to the triple store. Some of our clients have direct access to the triple store, and we have to keep a balance between the two. For us, the balance is between using custom APIs in front of the triple store and exposing the actual Sparkle endpoints centers around performance and data integrity. So if you have APIs, you could make effective use of caching layers. You could write optimized Sparkle queries that work and apply them to all the clients just once. And in terms of data integrity, which is absolutely crucial because this use case is used to drive audience-facing products, we need a lot of checks to make sure the data that goes into the system is of high quality. Otherwise, you have some really embarrassing things popping up on the front page, which has happened in the past. I won't show you any screenshots of the kind of things. But you can imagine if things are improperly tagged, you can have adult content on children pages, you can have out of context things happening. So it's extremely important in terms of data quality to kind of like protect the data with these APIs. I realize many practitioners don't like this. The idea of exposing Sparkle endpoints um, means that clients are very flexible, they can innovate quickly. For now, there tends to be a certain bottleneck. If a client wants to use the data in a new way or format, they have to come to us, raise a request, 
for feature to be added to the API, and then we become kind of like the bottleneck and the hindrance for innovation. So it's getting that right balance that's the key for us. Most of our clients are happy to use our APIs, and for spe specific cases where we have to expose particular endpoints, a select few of well-trained internal clients have access to our Sparkle endpoint, have read-only access to our Sparkle endpoint. So that's the way it works. It's been working well for the past six years. It's been powering lots of different use cases within the BBC, and we've been thinking about going the next level and exposing this, making this open so people can actually hit the APIs from outside of the BBC. That has always been like the next, the next step. This is working all good. So about a year ago, we started looking at performance and scalability. We started seeing the rate at which we're ingesting data, because we never throw data away. We get new content metadata being generated every day, and the data keeps growing. And as adoption increases within the BBC and potentially in the general public, how can we ensure the thing is still scalable? So in 2017, we did some, some load forecasting tests. We saw that the actual data we have will double, and the performance, our SLAs will also take a, take a hitting at the current rates, assuming things don't improve. So that scalability bottleneck for kind of 2018, 2019, got us thinking about how can we improve this? How can we make this better? Obviously, we did quite a lot on the triple star itself to improve the performance and make it faster, and that has been all, all good. But a fundamental rethink of how we store data and how we publish this data was needed. And that's kind of like kicked off this work. It's been about a year since we've been experimenting different ideas and different ways. And what I'm gonna show you next is kind of like where we've gotten to in that evolution. So what do we know about the requests coming into our read API smart clients? Because those are our picky clients, the ones that have users like yourself relying on these queries to be fast and scalable. And what can we say about those queries? Well, we can begin to group them into what we call profiles. So if you look at query requests coming in, we can look at what type of Sparkle queries are we generating for these API requests, and can we group them together to, into certain categories or query profiles? And if we can, then what can we do with that knowledge? So you can have some queries that look like this, just a client gives us an identifier and say, get me the document given this identifier. So it's a fairly simple um, by identifier query, which is okay. You have some that require some search and some filtering. So get me all the documents subject to these, these filters, these, these requirements. So we have to do some filtering in there to get data out. And you have some that actually use the, the, the graph, want you to traverse the graph a bit more, a few hops from a certain point, get me all the documents that have this relationship, that have that relationship, that has that value. And so we have to do a bit more graph-based based querying. And we can also look at grouping our, our REST API clients by performance and volume requirements. So we can ask ourselves, how often do these clients hit us? and what are the, their performance requirements and begin to group requests based on that as well. So this is kind of like, it's not very strict, it's a blurred categorization, but it works quite well for us. You have some clients that are low volume, so they'll hit us a few hundred times an hour, and low performance requirements as well. So they don't really mind if we take half a second, or maybe even a second to, to respond. They're kind of happy with that. There's some clients that hit us with a lot of requests, a few hundred thousand an hour, and really, really care that the request comes in in less than 100 milliseconds or something like that. Otherwise, audience-facing products begin to see, see slowness. It's generally divided along the editorial and distribution line. So the editorial tools tend to be more forgiving. The tool manned by a journalist tends to be more forgiving. They can wait for half a second or a second to get these things happen. On the other hand, two tools that systems that are for audience-facing product have to be really fast. There's also something to say about the complexity of the queries, although this isn't very clean cut, but it tends to be the editorial tools have slightly more complex queries than those powering the distribution end. So with all these, with all these groupings, we can begin to put clients together, or more accurately, put requests together into request profiles. And this, is, this becomes, the, this is the controversial bit. Do we need to send all these things through to a triple store? We need to send all these requests through to a graph database. Are all queries graph-like? Yes, the data itself is best represented in a graph, but do all the queries actually, are they actually optimized for, for, for graph databases? And the, the hypothesis is no. So what do we do to experiment this? Well, can we begin to move some clients off, off the triple store and put them in other data, other data sources? And is it going to be easy and feasible to keep these data sources in sync? And that's kind of like where we started from. And it's all about evolutionary architectures, right? You start with where you are and slightly evolve your architecture, learn from what you've done, and potentially roll back if you have to. 
So about a year ago, we started tinkering around the, the seams about the whole system and seeing what works, what doesn't work. And now we're now in a, in a case where we have about 70% of all the requests that used to go to the triple store going elsewhere. This is the target architecture, the vision. This is what we, we set out to achieve when we started. I'm not sure we're, we're here at the moment, but something similar. So we still have our APIs on both ends. We have our write API and our read API. So our clients don't know anything's changed. They're still interacting with us the way they've always done. The only clients who aren't going to benefit from all these are the clients who hit our sparkle endpoint directly for reading. And they're actually specialized in the first place. They do real hardcore um, graph um, and base query. So they're suited for the triple store. That's why they have the need direct Sparkle access in the first place. So they, they're kind of okay. The rest of our clients just continue using the system as, as they've always done. And behind the scenes, what we're now doing is every request that comes to the right API, after it's gone through validation and checks and, and it's all good, it comes in as an event. And that event will stay in an event store. And then we have these publishing pipelines for each event that comes in. A copy of that event gets ingested through these publishing pipelines. And these pipelines will then take that data, format it in a given way, and put it in a separate database. It might be an S3 bucket, it might be a Dynamo table, it might be an RDS table, or it might just remain in the triple store where it's always been. So we have these copies of the same data, which always makes people nervous. We have these copies of the same data in these various views, and they're now APIs that you can then use to serve, serve that data out to clients. The idea or the vision is when requests then come in, we can determine what profile you're based on and see what view is best used to satisfy that, that request. So that's the, that's the plan, that's the hope. Um, microservices come in here very well because first of all, you want to be able to build something small and throw it away if you don't need to. You want to be able to scale certain bits of the system independently of the rest. So previously we had two massive APIs sitting in front and on both sides of the triple store, read and write. Now you want to be able to build certain components that need to scale and scale them independently. You want to be able to have reusable components that you can use in various ways, especially given the fact that these, these publishing pipelines are almost going to be identical in many of the components they need. So we, we have to start splitting things up um, much more. So I'll zoom into that, show you an example of what a typical one of this will look like and what a typical one of the distribution ones will look like as well. So the publishing one, yeah, it's, it's what mentioning here that we didn't stop what we currently do. So while all this process is going on, we still have our central triple store, our source of truth. We still have our write and read APIs that are feeding that. So that isn't changing. We're just evolving the architecture, adding extra bits on top of that and removing extra bits when we need. So that's still happening. Clients are still happy. They're still being served the way they've always been served. What, what we do as a side effect for ingest is for every um, operation that comes to our write API, we create an event and put it in a queue. That queue, that queue then powers a lambda. Once again, you can see the scalability benefits from using things like serverless, lambdas, or small APIs that you can just build up, spin up, and throw away. That lambda will pretend to be a client, query the data from the read API like any other clients would do. It might do some transformation depending on what it's meant, what the pipeline's objectives are, and it will insert it into some special custom database, whatever database we choose for that particular pipeline. So once that's done, there's an API, a dumb API in front of the, that view that can just fetch that data and return it to the clients. And that's pretty much how the publishing pipeline works. There are a few things we do. If there's a failure in any of the steps within the ingest, we put that into a DLQ, then let's queue that can then be picked up automatically or manually, depending on what the error is, and fixed. Uh, clients also like to know when we ingested something, especially the editorial clients. They like to know when something has actually gone to our system and is available. So we have a lambda that raises an SNS that they can then respond to. We also do some quality checks at the end. So after the ingest, we would also simulate being a client query both ends. The new view API, the old read API, make sure they are consistent and the data looks the same. If there's any issue, we dump in the DLQ for automatic reprocessing or manual reprocessing, depending on what the actual error looks like. So that's pretty much it. We have a few of these pipelines already running, so each time somebody does a write, it triggers all these, these things that happen, and then each of them go off and do their own work and dump it in one of the, the views. On the read side, our clients come in once again through our read API like they've always done. We now have a router component sitting behind the read API that will get that request, look at the request, and route it to one of the views. If it doesn't find a suitable view, it just falls back to the triple store and does what it's always been doing and sends a request to the triple store. So clients don't see any change in terms of the performance or the, um, the, 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 the 
contracts you have with them vis-a-vis -vis your API. Uh, so a, a typical rule would look like this. I've written it in my own custom language. If request matches this format and uh, query parameter looks like this, there are other conditions we can put in there. Then route the traffic to route one. Otherwise, just fall back to fall back to the default triple store. If things fail, say the view hasn't caught up because it's an event-driven system, the views may lag behind the triple store because it might take a while. Imagine there's a bulk ingest, the view might struggle. Although we have lambdas that scale up quite quickly, but it is possible that the view hasn't caught up and it doesn't have the data you want, you can just fall back M3 triple store. Or if there's a genuine fault, a network fault, because now we have these small services, you have to think about network, network issues that arise from doing all that. You can always fall back to the triple store. When we're building these new views, we can also do load splitting, load balancing, which is also quite important. So when we try out something new, say we say we think that an S3 bucket, okay, a Dynamo table, is faster at serving this particular query profile than our triple star. It's a bold statement to make. We can then actually set this thing up, use all the components, and start moving traffic, 10% of the traffic there, and observe the performance. And if we're happy, we can then move all the traffic for that particular request profile to, to that end. So that works fine. We've done this. We have a few of these things already running. We decided to do a few, see how it works, and maybe do some more if we need to. The beauty about evolving it this way is you can stop at any time and say, OK, we never get worse than we were before. We can only get better, because we still have the triple store as our single source of truth, and the APIs are still powering that. So it's done. We have about 70% of the traffic um, that used to go to the triple store being served by other data sources now, and the more complicated graph-based um, queries are going to the triple store, and there's overall performance everywhere. Everything's happy. Well, it's been a wonderful success. Well, there are issues. There are a few issues we have to consider. The first one we met about was joins. So typically, this is how the data looks like. We have a document on uh, on some article. It has lots of properties here. I haven't shown them all. And you have the about, about um, property, and you have a few IDs for the various um, tags. So that's all good. And then for each of these tags, you have um, the, the label, the type, same as, and all the extra data. So there are two separate entities. The ontology is fairly simple, but it's well detailed, designed by really smart people, and it works well. The problem is clients normally want a hydrated data. So when they ask us the, the, the question, they don't want to have to make these hops. They want hydrated data. They want the whole thing in one response. So what we used to do previously is on ingest, we send the data into the right API to our triple store. And then when clients make a request, we just use, build a Sparkle query that constructs the data they want and send it out to them. And it works. Now we lose all that because we have copies of the data in, in, in various views. How do we handle that, that merging as a big problem? So the two ways you could do this, or three actually, you can join on writes. So any time there's a change in an article, either new tags are added or old tags are removed, you have to go to all the copies of the articles in your view and make those changes. A bit scalable, you don't have many views. If you have three, four views, that's okay. Any time a tag changes, so if you change the label of a tag, then what you do, you have to go to all the places that tag is used in the views and then modify those. And that could be tricky for popular tags. We have tags like Brexit, Donald Trump, there is a me, but extremely popular. So joining on popular in terms of the number of, <laughs> yeah, <it's> the, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, you get what I mean. Uh, so joining on rights can be tricky. It, it's fine for some things, and it's, it's, it's going to take a while for others. That being said, it looks, it looks terrible when I say it, but in practice, we ingest all our data in a very short period anyway. So it is doable practically. It just means the view is going to spend some time um, reprocessing before it gets back up to serve traffic. And these things hardly change anyway. So it, is, it can be done, but, but that's just one option. Second one would be to join on read. So we have different ingest pipelines for the different entities. So for tags, we have its own ingest pipeline. For articles or content, we have the, its own ingest pipeline. We store them separately. And then when a client makes the request, we don't have the triple store to, to do the joining database. We have to do it ourselves through HTTP calls. Um, the, the disadvantage of this, the, the advantage of this is the, the, the ingest pipelines are simple. They're clear, just simple as they've always been. The advantage is you then have to do processing on read, which kind of defeats the purpose of the whole thing. You don't want to do any processing, you want to have prepared document, materialized views. And so you have to 
strike the right balance. An optimal solution, we feel, would be to do joins on rights for some things and joins on reads for the other. That's actually what you want to do. But we didn't do that. We just did all joins on reads. Uh, it, re it reduces the performance of the overall system, but it's still better than the, way, than the way it was when we served these three triple stores. It sounds weird, crazy, that you make one request and then make a few HTTP calls to merge a document, and yet um, it's still slightly better. But we do have the option of splitting that in the future and doing some, some joins on writes and some joins on read you know, that can be achieved. So we've kind of fixed the join problem for now, and it works. Other things to consider. Am I doing the time? OK. Uh, one more thing to consider. I think I'll just do this one, and then that's it. Uh, we have a fairly fairly rich and detailed ontology, um, built quite a long time ago. I was in I was in the, in the VC when we did that. It was about five, six, six years ago or more before the Olympics. We have modified it slightly since then, but it's basically the same thing we we use still today. And it's public. I think there's an ontology's website, and I think the, the actual GitHub repo is going to be made public soon as well. So it's all there. And it's all good. One of the things that the, the, the triple star gives us is inference. So the ontologies help describe the data, but they're also a base for the inference engine that the triple star uses. So when you add an extra an update to the ontology, you have to be very careful at what the implications of that will be. Now we have, we manage the ontology updates, which is also another bottleneck, but we manage it. So any changes to the ontologies has to be made through, through our team. And you have to look at it and say, how much more data is going to be generated? So if you say uh, Biz Company is a subclass of core organization, which you could say, then all the triples for Biz Company get this extra one added onto it, which is good. I mean, a huge chunk of our data in the triple store is implicitly generated. And the clients don't care. Remember, they're querying an API. They're getting data back. None of their business, how you're generating that data or how you're keeping it consistent. And it's been fine up until now because the triple store does all that for you. So if you make a change like this, triple star goes into its own world, uh, generates all the extra data. And when it's ready, it says, yeah, I'm ready. I can serve clients that data. Now we have copies of the data everywhere, and all the rest don't have inference engines, except you want to use third party ones to put in there to be very messy. So this is kind of a problem for us. We've set this up for about, it's been running. I think our first view came up about eight, nine months ago. We've had a few, we've, we've added two more since then. They've all been fine. We haven't, we haven't had to do an, an ontology change, but we've had to do complete re-ingests of our data. So our triple store is still kind of like our event store for now. It's still the single source of truth where all the data lives. So if an, if an ontology change that requires an ingest happen, we would have to ingest to the triple store and replay our views. And we've, we have had to replay our views in the past. It takes a while, um, less than an hour. We get all our views back up and running because we can scale. The pipelines can scale. You can have. Uh, What's the, what's the limit of lambdas you can have running? You can have 10,000 lambdas running at the same time, and that, and that would just cost you a lot of money, but, but, but you can do that. So we have had to actually um, do this and replay lots of our views when things happen. So the, the first time we have an ontology change that requires considerable change in our inferencing, and we would have to do that, and we'll see how that goes. That is one thing to keep an eye on with the whole solution. So I guess the, the main thing, oh, sorry, did I go back? The main summary is this, and I was worried saying this in a graph database talk with all these people who love graph databases, is, is it is possible to move some of your data or copies of your data out of a graph database into more other databases that are best suited for those queries. We use DynamoDB most of the time, but we did try S3 with a cache. We tried RDS. We tried various things, and it's allowed to do that, especially if you have this evolutionary architecture mentality don't design the whole system up at once. Don't get some architects to sit in some room and build a massive architecture diagram and hand it over to the developers. If you do things bit by bit, you can try things out. And we have found that it's feasible to have these copies, keep them in sync in reasonable time, and improve the performance of the overall system. And that's pretty much what we've done. And it works so well. Thank you. Thanks, Agustin. And any questions? Well, I see one already. Sorry, quickly. How much data do you have? Overall, uh, in terms of triples, they're not, not much, about between 150 million triples in total. So not much at all. I think it's a matter of the re requirements, expectations for performance, especially from our audience-facing products. So they want data really fast. Calls to us are just one call in their 
in their pipeline. They have to get data from us and then do something with that data to display it on, on the front page. So they need data really fast. It's not like we can't get them data. We can get them data in 300 milliseconds, but some of our clients are just too slow. So, so it's, a, it's a matter of performance requirements as opposed to anything else. But yeah, not much. You were talking about uh, serving views with yeah. this uh, structure, so I understand it's web views, yeah. yes. And um, but are you also using the graph to to do to work on the navigation? So moving from one view to another to generate, for example, a dynamic navigational uh, elements. Um, I think when I meant views, I actually mean just APIs. So this isn't actually web views. Sorry, it's not web views. Right. It's just representations of the data through different APIs that are already pre-built. So basically there's no processing done on read. That's the cell. We prepare the data in a in a pre-baked form and display that. So various views of the same data. You can have the same data in RDF. You can have it in JSON LD in one view. You can have it in RDF XML in another. You can have the same data in Turtle. In another. So there are different views of the same data in various databases that clients can then query. So it's still all APIs. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. okay, so I understand what you mean with yeah. views now, um, but the, the clients using that, yes. that would be maybe the uh, website? Yeah, exactly, um, homepage, sports page, iPlayer, whatever use case they have, they, they can then query us and get that data. I'm not too, too, I don't have too much details of all the use cases, I know navigation is one of them. But the primary use case is aggregation, I think. That's where tagging really comes. We just talk about using it more for recommendations and things like that. But it's mainly aggregation. Get me all the data that look alike. Get me all the data that have been tagged with the same thing. Or get me all the data that, that are in this domain or in this area. That's primarily what it's used for. Right, to, to kind of keep on keep on reading. So here's yeah. the other article to talk about. Yeah. It. Um, is it um, Are some of the clients also working on personalization, that oh, yeah. they actually learn which yeah, ones? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a big move for that in the BBC um, in the past few years. And, and yeah, we're getting more and more clients that, that are looking into that area. A lot of these things is publication. You may have noticed I'm talking about publication data. But there's a lot of pre-publication things that happen before you get the data in front of you in your website. And those things we don't currently capture in this in this format. We were kind of like a, a tool for publishing content metadata. But all the pre-publication steps don't happen yet. And that's really where things like machine learning and recommendations really can really take take up. So yeah, there is there is um, interest in that area. My team is not just responsible for doing that. We're just responsible for keeping the lights on on this thing and making sure that uh, it's still ticking over. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, triple store is a single source of truth. Is that because the event store is a recent development? Uh, yes, so when we started this, you had this target architecture where we have an event store that is a single source of truth that does everything. And one of the first mistakes we did is we actually built the event store. We looked at different options, took, choose one that we wanted and deployed it. And we started serving off event store. And then we realized the triple store actually, the triple store in collaboration with an input queue does what the event store is meant to do for us for now. So we didn't have to have something else that, that's a single source of truth. As long as the triple store has the most recent value of all the entities, the current state of affairs. We can always replay that fairly quickly and get the effects we would have had from an event store. So we, one of the rollbacks, the first rollbacks we did in our team was to ditch that and then just use the triple store as our single source of truth. There are use cases in the future where we might need an event store and we do know how to build one or use one off the shelf. But that, the architecture I showed you was more of a conceptual, conceptual one, an actual literal event store. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask, what's the most complex query profile that you're dealing with? One of the cases I used to remember was queries of the type, I want articles of politicians of the Tory party born in, I don't yeah, know, Birmingham. Yeah. Do you have this case solved with this new architecture? We, yeah, we have basically those are filter queries. So get me all the query, get me all the, all the content about blah, 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 where all these restrictions apply. Those are filter queries. Those are bread and butter. We have those coming from clients all the time. The more complex ones don't go through our systems. The more complex ones tend to be within the BBC done by the, the, the learning BBC learning people because they have this elaborate vocabulary around curriculum, BBC curriculum. I think it's also open source, that one, about BBC curriculum, what's, what, 
what subjects are under what category, and, and their queries tend to be really complicated and really traverse the graph more than one or two hops, and they query the triple store directly to get that information. So we can't keep up with building those functionality into an API for them. In terms of what our API does, it's mainly what you said, get stuff by ID, get stuff subject to this filter, and we'll have one query that has to do with co-occurrence. So get me two, two um, contents that, have, that are most similar together, that, have, that share the most amount of tags in a given domain. So that's kind of like our most complex query where we have to actually do two hops to, to actually serve that result. So from the API's perspective, it's fairly simple. That's why we could move 70% off. So most of the queries the triple story serving now are the things it was designed to do, really difficult Sparkle queries. And it has improved the performance of the triple store. It has improved the performance of all the other query profiles, because DynamoDB is really, really fast at serving things by ID. So if you give it a document and give it an ID, it will serve it to you before you can blink. And so, so that works well for us. Yeah. Afterwards. Yeah. Cool. Thank you.